Good morning again. We're uh, having a wonderful time together. I, at least I am. I hope you are. Uh, we're in the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 10. A very familiar parable. I think if anyone was probably in Sunday school, even for one year of their life, they've definitely heard this parable, and you'll be familiar with it. That's the parable of the Good Samaritan. But uh, before we get to it, uh, we want to understand why we, what are we supposed to get out of a parable? So uh, what do you do with a parable? Now, if you've been in any kind of Bible studies where the parables are discussed, you'll find that there's lots of opinions and lots of uh, things that people hone in on as their main focus. Um, and so we want to know, like, what are we supposed to do with parables? What are we supposed to notice? What are we supposed to learn from it? Are the details important? Is the trivial important? And those kind of questions. And, and you've probably been there where there's a parable being discussed and somebody just wants to talk about some very minuscule detail that happens to be in the text, but it's really not the main point, right? Um, and so we, it's important from just an understanding of how to read the Bible and how to understand the Bible that uh, parables are generally just a, a brief story or illustration that normally contain just one point. There's one main idea, and that is the most important thing to get from. Uh, and, and it's good to understand the historical and cultural context of the parables. So we do that. We say, what was the culture like? What was going on at that time? But we should avoid getting caught up in trying to make more of the parable than was intended. Uh, parables usually uh, drive home one main point to the ones hearing it. So we're going to look at this one this morning and try to find out what's the main idea, what's the main point of this parable. So let's look at it together. I'm going to read from Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 25, and you can follow along. I recommend if you have your Bible, you open it up and look at it, but if you don't have it handy, we'll have it on the screen for you. It says, And behold, a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. So there's two very important questions that we're going to focus on that this lawyer, and we're going to talk about what kind of lawyer this was, what he asked, two questions he asked of Jesus. The first one was, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And the second question, who is my neighbor? Again, the main question the parable of the Good Samaritan addresses is the second one, but both of these questions are very important for us to digest and try to figure out. So let's see how really those two questions are part of the same problem. So let's go back to that first uh, verse I just read, uh, verse 25. Behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? 
it says it was a lawyer. It's not a lawyer like we would think of a lawyer today. We've got all kinds of different lawyers in our world. We have immigration attorneys. We have defense attorneys. We have attorneys that just take care of uh, wills and things like that and financial things. That's not what we're talking about here. This guy was an expert not in the, the law of the land in the sense of the statutes that the community imposed, but he was an expert on the law of God. He was an expert on the commandments handed down to Moses uh, to be passed on to the people, as well as he would have known all the additional rules that had been added on to these over the time, and there were a number of them. They would take God's rules and they would add subclauses within them, you know. They would try to uh, enhance those rules, so to speak. And so he would have been an expert on all of this. And as important as the answer to this question is, he didn't ask it because he wanted wisdom from Jesus. It says he asked it to test him. Have you ever had someone who is an expert in their area, whatever that area is, and they, they ask you questions, but you know what they're really trying to do is to find out how dumb you are about it? I mean, maybe I get that more than you, but uh, people that are experts in something often do this. The, he's taking the role of an examiner. And this happened again and again to Jesus during his ministry all the time. People were questioning Jesus, but as a test or sometimes to try to trip him up. And people will ask us questions as believers as well. And that's why Peter wrote in 1 Peter 3.15, in our heart. Christ, the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. That's a great verse. You've heard it before. It's often used by people that are in the apologetics type ministry. They use this verse to say this is why we want to train Christians to know the Bible, to know how to answer tough questions. And that's and Jesus gave us many examples of how to answer people who present us with questions, even questions that aren't presented with a pure motive. You can have an honest person who's asking you questions, truly trying to find out, but often you get people who are asking you questions and they're trying to prove you wrong or they're trying to say something sarcastic. But Jesus gives us an example here of some of the strategies we might use to answer questions like that. So his first question was, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Verse 26, he said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? So this is a typical rabbi's response. He answers the question with a question. This is Some people say this would be the Aristotle method, but this is way before Aristotle. So he turns it back on the questioner. Do the same thing sometimes. In fact, uh, if you become at ease at this type of interaction with people, you may be able to go deeper than what the question really being asked uh, on the surface was and find out the real motive. And so Jesus is showing us here one way that we can deal with questions like this. And the man gives the correct answer in verse 27. He answered, this sounds familiar, Kevin. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. So he, he answers this question with a question, and then the man responds. But you see on the screen here what it says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and neighbor as myself. But who can do that? Who can do that perfectly to God's standards? No one has other than Jesus. I mean, has anyone even kept this for five minutes perfectly? And, and out of the two, I would say maybe you could say loving God seems the easier. Or at least he's lovable, right? But loving the neighbor as yourself, that's difficult. I just heard a story of a neighbor a week ago, and this sounds like a very difficult neighbor to love. And, uh, I, and I've heard stories like that again and again from other people. And I've had those stories myself with neighbors difficult to love. Um, 
so it's really a very difficult thing. This man is answering correctly. These are the things you need to do. But who has done it? No one's done this perfectly. If they had, they'd be sinless. Because love of God and loving God perfectly would mean keeping his commandments perfectly. And it would mean loving neighbor perfectly. So the person who could do this would be a perfect person. But no one is. So the lawyer has quoted here uh, from two passages of Scripture. The first one, uh, Kevin beat me to the punch on part of this, but in Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And the neighbor part, that comes from Leviticus 19, 18. It says, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now, Jesus said that those two commandments are the sum of the law and the prophets. The Ten Commandments, we, when we talk about that, and you've been to a teaching perhaps on that in your life at some point, as you know that there's, there's Ten Commandments, there's four that have to do with our relationship with God, and the other six are, have to do with how we relate to one another as human beings. Um, and so Jesus said that the two commandments, loving God with all your so heart and soul and might, and loving your neighbor, they basically sum up the commandments, and that is true. So this answer is a good answer. The lawyer answered well. Remember the question he asked, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And the answer is to love God in every, with every fiber of your being and love your neighbor as yourself. So you're to love God with all your heart. So all your passion, all your drive, everything should be motivated by love for God. You're to love God with all your soul. David said, my soul thirsts for God, the living God. We're to love God with all of our strength. All of our physical abilities should be put to work to please God. And we're to love him with all our mind. This is where a lot of, a lot of Christians like to do the work, and they, they like volunteer stuff, but they don't like the mind part. I haven't figured that one out yet. But loving God with all your mind, you should want to know him better through his word, studying his word, being transformed by the renewal of your mind. And that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and, and perfect. That is work, though. we got to go back to school every day. I have a, an idea for that. Kevin already gave it. G6, right? That's why we do it. We, we need to be people who love God with our mind. And we want to love our neighbor as ourself. Now, this is impossible to do perfectly this side of heaven. Who can honestly say that they've done this, that they've put any other human on perfectly equal footing with themselves in love? Who can say that every decision and action they take considers neighbor just as equally as it considers self? So this man has answered well, and Jesus tells him, that's a good answer. Verse 28, he said to him, you've answered correctly, do this and you will live. So Jesus takes his question, remember the original question, what do I do to inherit eternal life? And, and he says, what, would, what does the scripture say? And he says, love God all the way, love him completely, and love the neighbor. And Jesus says, great, go do that. But the man's not secure in that. And when we do not feel justified in something, we try to justify ourselves. Have you ever been with someone who, or seen someone who's clearly not up to the job they have? Many of us have worked with someone or for someone who was not competent in their job. And these people can be a little dangerous, in a sense. If you have someone who is incompetent and doesn't know it, that's one thing. But an incompetent person who knows that they are incompetent, that's something else altogether. They know that they're not up to it. And they are terrified that others will find them out. And so what do they do? They justify themselves. We might say they're justifying their, their existence at that job or they're justifying their job. They may take credit for other people's work. Or they may constantly recite their inflated list of accomplishments. But inside, they live in constant stress because they're concerned that they will be found out to be a fraud. 
And this man, he wants to justify himself. He's answered a question well, but he knows that even though he has identified the way to eternal life, he has not met that criteria. And none of us have. And that worries him. And so he asks this second question, verse 29. He, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? So the first question had a motive to it. Remember the motive? Put him to the test. The second question has a motive. He desires to justify himself. By the way, you can't justify yourself. Only Jesus can justify you, so come to Jesus. Now, the first question, Jesus answered with his own question. The second question, Jesus will answer with another question. This time, Jesus' question back to him is essentially the same question that he asked Jesus. He pretty much asked the same question back to him at the end of this passage. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? So, so he asked Jesus, who's my neighbor? And Jesus gives this little story, and then he says, which one was the neighbor? They're basically asking the same question back to him. So before we examine Jesus' question again, though, let's look at the parable again. So verse 30, Jesus begins, and he says, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, but he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Well, sadly, there's stories like this all the time throughout human history. I mean, I've seen them on the news. You probably have, too. Somebody's been beat up. Someone's laying on the side of the sidewalk. I saw a video one time, and I, I think it was New York City, if I remember right, and this person was, they actually did it as a social experiment. They had someone pretend they were basically laying on the f sidewalk dying, and people literally stepped over or walked around like this parable. This is not a news story. Jesus isn't saying something that's just so wild no one could imagine it. This is something that happens, sadly, all the time. And Jesus, in this parable, he uses a local context that listeners could relate to. He's giving two locations, Jerusalem to Jericho. They would know where that was. We might say a man was walking along Okeechobee by the airport. And then your mind say, oh, yeah, I know where that is. Well, some of us know where that is. But some of us use our GPS, so we don't know where that is. And verse 31, now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he helped him out. Oh, no. He passed by on the other side. So many people then, just like today, they didn't necessarily care for priests. Even religious people don't always care for the priest. Yet some might defend this priest. Maybe they would say, well, you know, he could have been on the way to do service to the Lord and, and he couldn't defile himself by touching the bleeding man or else he would have had to go through a purification rites again. But this defense does not satisfy the God who desires mercy over sacrifice. So that's no good. We can't go there. We're not going to give this guy any excuse. And in verse 32... A repeat of the same thing just about with a different person. Likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. So another member of the clergy, so to speak, a Levite who was by birth born into the clan that was responsible for teaching the laws and for maintaining the tabernacle. And he passes by as well. So we might say in our time, if we're making this a local parable, a pastor walked by on the other side and then a professor from the religious school passed by as well. And then in verse 33, but a Samaritan as he journeyed came to where he was and when he saw him, he had compassion. Now, I won't go into the whole history of it. You might have even heard this taught before, but the Samaritans were pretty much hated by the Jewish people most of them. And I want to get into all the reasons, but they were truly, truly hated. They, this was two groups that did not get along together, and a lot of Jewish people wouldn't even pass through there because they hated them so bad. Maybe today the story would be that a member of Hamas came across the injured man. Someone hated. Someone that you wouldn't expect to give a lick of care but he had compassion. 
So it would be shocking for the people to hear that a Samaritan was the hero of the story, just like if we heard a story like this here in, in our area, and it turned out that the one who helped the guy was a, a member of Hamas on the run from the FBI. Well, let's consider where compassion comes from. It ought to be in our nature as humans. Yet it's marred by the fall. But God in his graciousness gives compassion for others to us. And this Samaritan had compassion. And in verse 34 it says, He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. So he took immediate action. He didn't delegate. He didn't go on to uh, later as the priest and the Levite had, probably to tell someone later how inconvenienced they were because they had to step aside around this guy and what a hassle that was. And I might have gotten germs, and, and I wish that guy had never been on the road because I had to see it. I can only imagine what they might have said later. But the Samaritan physically helped and financially helped this man and even made sure that he would continue to be taken care of after he left. And we see that in verse 35. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend I'll repay when I, you when I come back. So we're taking it from this context. We can assume this is a guy who the innkeeper knows, and he's promising him the next time I travel through here, he must have been a regular, that I will take care of any further bill beyond what you're spending on him, but take good care of him. This story would be nearly unbelievable to the people hearing Jesus tell it. I remember after 9-11, the news interviewed the neighbors of two of the terrorists. I think they were the ones that lived in Florida. They hijacked the plane. And these neighbors were being interviewed, and they said these, these young men were so nice. They were so polite. They even helped us carry in our groceries. They could not imagine that they were part of this terrorist plot and that they were the ones that flew the plane into the towers. Well, just as it's hard for us to understand how someone who seems rather pleasant can do such evil, it's also un, uh, under, hard to understand for us why someone who we see as evil could do any good, right? Once we get our frame of mind about someone, it's hard to imagine something different. So Jesus poses the question after telling this little story. He quotes, he puts the question back to the lawyer again. Verse 36, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He had asked who his neighbor was, and Jesus told the short parable, and now he brings the question back. Who was the neighbor? Now, I think we could say this is a rhetorical question. The answer is clear within the question. But let's ask it in a, such a basic and obvious way that even the youngest child could answer, let's do it in the simplest way possible as a multiple choice. In a multiple choice, we're reminded of the three options. So, who proved to be a neighbor to the man? Was it A, the priest? Was it B, the Levite? Or was it C, the Samaritan? Pretty obvious answer, right? And this man answers, verse 37, he said to him, the one who showed him, mercy and jesus said to him you go and do likewise so this man again i i might be reading a little much into that but his response he doesn't say the samaritan he can't even say it this is how they were so hated he can't even say well it was the samaritan he can't even give him the title of samaritan so rather than say that he says in this very generic way oh the one who showed him mercy he he's the neighbor i guess so these are the two important questions. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And who is my neighbor? The first question is very important. But in a sense, the question is wrong. Because it says, what shall I do? Well, it implies that there's something you can do to inherit eternal life. There isn't. At least not in the way that this man was thinking. There is a way, though, to have eternal life. And it is called repent and believe. If you had kept the commandments perfectly, 
if you had loved God and your neighbor perfectly, without fail, every second, every millisecond of your entire life, well, then you could have eternal life. But you have already failed in this. Everyone has. All have sinned and fall short. None is righteous. No, not one. We deserve God's wrath for our sin. We deserve death for our sin. But Jesus took these both on our behalf as our substitute. God's wrath was poured out on Jesus when he was on the cross. He died in our place. He was raised again so that we can have a guarantee to have eternal life. And the, that was the very thing this lawyer was concerned with, was eternal life. I need eternal life. What must I do? And he knew the answer. But the answer he knew could not be satisfied. He, didn't, he wasn't able to do it. But we can be saved. Romans 10, 8 to 10 says, But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we proclaim, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So that first question is very important. What, must I, what shall I do to inherit eternal life, you can't do anything except trust Jesus. The second uh, question is important also. Who is my neighbor? And the answer is everyone. Everyone is your neighbor. We tend to think of our neighbor, and we th when, s when you ask me who my neighbor is, I'm thinking of Paula on the one side and Amy on the other side and the other ones that go on beyond that. And I think those are my neighbors. Generally, that's our how we use our language. But really, the answer to this is your neighbor is everybody and people have examined this parable from every angle but let's remember again what's the purpose of a parable it's to make a main point one main point and the point of this parable is to answer the question who is my neighbor and the answer is everybody is your neighbor and neighbor is not the same as brother, by the way, brother or sister. In Christ, we're one family. We're not in relationship to those outside the church in the same way. There's a difference between neighbor and brother. We have a stronger obligation to those in the church, but we are to love all of our neighbors, and that's everybody. R.C. Sproul said this, There is a popular distortion of Christianity that teaches the universal fatherhood of God and the universal brotherhood of man. However, the central meaning of brotherhood and fatherhood in the New Testament refers to those who are the adopted children of God. The Bible does not teach a universal brotherhood of man, but it does teach a universal neighborhood of man. I am required to love each human being as much as I love myself. No wonder we fall under the weight of the demands of this law. You might be thinking nobody loves anybody as much as they love themselves, and nobody loves God with their whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, so why should we be exercised about our neighbors? But the point is, that is the standard by which we will be judged. God's requirements do not change simply because there is a universal disobedience to them. We can take no comfort from the fact that none of us keep the law. In fact, we should be terrified by the fact that God calls it the great commandment. Therefore, in the logic of the New Testament, the great transgression would be a failure to love God with all our heart, strength, and soul, and the failure to love our neighbor as much as ourselves. That's the great transgression. That's why we are all exposed to the wrath of God. That's why if we try to redeem ourselves through keeping the law, we will be lost forever. That's why we need Jesus. It is only by his righteousness that we will ever stand in the presence of God, end quote. Verse 27. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Can you do this perfectly? You cannot. You cannot. And you have not. Even if you could from today forward, it's too late. Because you would have had to keep this all the way through your life perfectly the entire time. For every millisecond, you could have never had a thought that put yourself above anybody else. 
Not one of us can claim that. Can you keep this perfectly? You cannot. But Christ has done it for us. And because he has, we must strive to do this. He was perfect in all of his attitudes, thoughts, actions. He perfectly loved neighbor as self. He perfectly kept all of the commandments of God. And so when he went to that cross, he was a sacrifice, the only one ever that was completely sufficient for all people who would put faith in him for all time. Scripture says once for all. Only one sacrifice was needed. And in fact, we read that from Hebrews earlier. We don't have to have Christ go to the cross again and again, thank God. His sacrifice was sufficient. And so when we come to this, this guy who has this interaction with Jesus, here standing before him as the solution to his problem. And, and he's, we're not sure whether he figured it out in the end or not. Doesn't tell us whether he became a believer or not. But there are some lessons there. The one main lesson of this whole parable is, who's my neighbor? Everybody. It's a very simple lesson. But there's a few other lessons within that that we can see first is the attitude with which this man came with his questions we have to be careful what our motive is when we ask god questions we can go to god we talked about that in sunday school this morning when we don't understand what his why he's telling us to do something we can bring that to him and say lord i'm having trouble understanding this please help me but if our attitude is no i'm not gonna i want to trap you i want to get you caught in a something where I can have an argument or I want to justify myself so I'm going to define neighbor in my way. Because my two neighbors I mentioned, I think they would probably say I'm a really great neighbor. I heard one of them say it once. Who said it? <laughs> but if I expand that to all the people who aren't as pleasant as my two next door neighbors, I have, I have not been perfect. No one has. Christ has, though, and he, he did this perfectly on our behalf. He went to the cross. Uh, so we have to be careful with our attitude of how we ask these questions, too. I think it's good that we come and go to D6, we go to other Bible studies, we listen to, I know a lot of you listen to different podcasts or YouTube videos of preaching and that kind of thing, and that's great. All of that is great. But make sure that you have the attitude you're to have when you hear those things, when you interact with those things? Are you truly trying to know Christ better? Or are you just trying to get a little wiser than your person sitting next to you or something you can argue a point on? Sometimes that's the motivation. We want to get smarter so we can look smarter. And instead, we should want to know better our Lord and Savior. The good news is that he allows us to keep knowing him better. And so he's given us the church, this great gift. He's given us his word to study. And he's given us his spirit to guide and empower us. And so let's give him thanks for that. Lord, thank you for this message. May it encourage us, Lord, to know that Christ met the perfect standard that we can't meet. And I pray, Lord, that we would take seriously this concept of who our neighbor is, which is everyone. And Lord, we have not loved as well as we should. We ask for your help that we would do better, that we would follow Christ and be like Christ to all those we encounter, even those who are cruel to us. Or May we always, Lord, be willing to put others above ourselves. We need your help, Lord, to do it, though. So please grant us your help. We believe. Please help our unbelief. We want to serve. Please help when we're lacking service. We want to love. Help our unlove. Please do it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.